I first got, I was first spotted uh, in a professional way when I was working in a club in London uh, called the Condor Club. And um, I didn't know it, but um, a famous songwriter, Lionel Bart, had seen me and he told Larry Parnes, who was Tommy Steele's manager, um, that there was a rock and roll singer there who was pretty good. And he, I suppose he must have said like, something like that because Parnes arrived the next day at my home with a contract, and uh, which was quite outstanding, really. I looked back on it. And my mother said, Someone's, there's been a man at the door. He wants to sign you up. And I thought, well, here we go. And uh, she said, I said, what's his name? She said, Larry Parnes. I, 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 it, it was like saying Simon Cowell or something like that. It was incredible. And uh, I knew from that moment, I knew that was it. My life, was, my life I'd, I'd, I'd done it. It was like a golfer winning a major championship for the first time. I knew that it would change my life. I had always wanted to be a singer since I was since I was you know a small top really I guess in many ways although I don't think I realised it at the time and I used to sing I had a little ukulele and when I was about eleven or ten I used to sing for my my father's friends sing all these funny little songs and um, but that I realised I was I was pretty poor at school I could not concentrate. My concentration levels were low until he got to music. And um, so I found that I got tremendous uh, praise and, and I got very large self-esteem from, from people who were saying, no, you're great, that's it, great son, you know. And I thought, wow, I'm achieving something. But at school, I could not achieve. I couldn't, I could, I couldn't be bothered. I was too busy looking at, I was tapping, I was always tapping, making jokes and singing songs or writing things down. So, yeah, that was me. <laughs> From mid-1958 to the end of 1959, Marty Wilde was one of the leading British rock and roll singers, along with Tommy Steele and Cliff Richard. Top five hits such as Teenager in Love, Sea of Love, Donna and Endless Sleep catapulted Marty Wilde into the UK charts as a teenage heartthrob that took the nation by storm. Well, being once Larry Parn signed me up, uh, that completely transformed the way that I would live. I mean. I was taken out of uh, being, you know, at home with mum and dad and, you know, fairly secure sort of situation. And uh, that all changed uh, to an unsecure situation in many ways because I, I was out on the road. I'd be out on the road. And I was out for the first year, I think I was out for maybe 40 weeks, 44 weeks of the year. Uh, once I, you know, once I started to really get out on the road. And I remember, I would see photographs of me now when I was 17. And I was so thin, I, was, I looked undernourished. I mean, I looked like I'd, you know, I'd been maltreated by somebody. But it was just, a, all of us were the same. I mean, the musicians were thin, everyone was thin in those days. You had no choice, you know, you couldn't. And there wasn't all the things to eat, lovely things to eat as there are these days. Well, uh, you know, I, I adjusted fairly quickly to being a star, if that's whatever the word that means in these uh, this day and age. I, I adjusted. It was it's, to me, it was almost like a natural process. You know, that's what you that's what happened to you. And um, girls screamed, and you got a hit record. And I was always looking on for the next thing. But it was, it was a nice feeling. Uh, it was a a satisfying feeling because, uh, as I say, at school I'd been such a poor scholar, um, so it, it, it made up for it, there's no question. I think it changed me at odd times, you know, life, life is like that. Um, it can, you get in situations, um, maybe it's, I don't know, you, different situations can change you slightly, but all the way through that I never, I never felt um, I was like 
something special and all that. I never felt that at all. I just felt I was doing a job. I just wanted to get out and sing and play guitar and, and please people, because every time I did, not only did they get a buzz, but I got a tremendous buzz. And um, as I say, it goes right the way back to when I was at school, underachieving and not, you know, never getting much praise. So when I, when, uh, when I do sing, it, even now, you know, you sing like Teenager in Love and you go, the people of all ages singing this, this song, you know, which is, um, it does seem strange to hear an 81 year old man singing Teenager in Love and people enjoying it, but they do. So, uh, but it's uh, part of life's pattern, I guess. Teenager in Love is not my favorite song, but it, it, it's the public's favorite. Um, you know, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy song to sing, uh, it's, it's, it's not complicated, and, um, <laughs> but they love it, you know. Uh, you know, I remember once um, there was a politician and who was a keen fan, and I remember watching him singing it with me. I thought, you know, how can someone so intelligent or reasonably intelligent get a kick out of singing each time we have a quarrel? You know, it breaks my heart. And there he was, singing away. So it does. So people, people just enjoy it. You know, I think lyrics, lyrics of a lot, lots of songs really absurd. Some of them are not absurd, but close to being absurd. But who cares? They're fun. <laughs> Despite intense competition from many other artists, Marty's version of A Teenager in Love reached number two in the UK in 1959. With a string of top five hits by the time he'd reached 20 years old, Marty boasts a monumental global music career that spanned over seven decades, including co-writing daughter Kim Wilde's hits, Kids in America and Cambodia. Why must I be a teenager in love? I cried a tear for nobody but you. I'll be a lonely one if you should say we're through. As an era that saw Marty notch up more chart hits than any other decade, the 60s were a time he celebrates musically, personally, and professionally. Making a song, if you ask someone to write a song that would stand the test of time, they'd have, they could never do it. They, they could do it, but they would never even know they've done it. You know, I'm sure that when uh, like, like Freddie Mercury, you know, a phenomenal writer, wrote some of those songs, I bet he didn't, he, I bet he couldn't envisage when he was writing some of those songs that they would be filling stadiums and people would be going, you know, absolutely mad years afterwards, not just at the time. And the same for Lennon McCartney, you know, they, um, I'm sure when they write, you write songs you just don't know. When I, I wrote, I remember Jessamine, which was a hit for a group called The Casuals. It's one of the best songs I was ever involved with. And I got the title off of a, um, a restaurant in Liverpool. And, and um, I saw Jessamine, I thought, that's a nice name. That's a really nice name. Wrote, wrote this song on a tiny little tape recorder. And um, never thought any more about it. And the chap I was writing with, Ronnie Scott, who was a great writer, he said, um, you know, let, why don't we, why don't you, we finish that? I'll, I'll help you finish it. 
So I said, yeah, okay, well, we will, let's, let's do it. And then we made a little rough little tape, tiny little tape recorder. The next time I hear it, it's number two or three in the charts. And it knocked me back. I, you don't know, you know, you just don't know. You could, I could sit there all day trying to write another Jessamine and, and never come out. You, you're best never to think about it and move on. But and I've always said to someone, if you think writing songs is dead easy, hit songs. People say, oh, a load of trash, I could write that. I'd put you in jail and you, I'll let you out when you've written the hit song. And I think you'd be, uh, you'd be there for a quite, quite a lot of years, I tell you. Most people would anyway, yeah. if they ever got out at all. Yeah. I enjoy and have enjoyed uh, writing for other people uh, as much as if it was me singing, more so. I can't sing some of those songs. There's no point of a silly old man singing some of those words and, and that it doesn't work. Um, and you know, you, I just know by instinct when it's not going to be for me. But it, even so, I've had songs that maybe I would even almost like to have done, but if you're going to write for someone, you write for someone. And the joy of them having a hit, it's nothing to do with money. I mean, it's not if you're going to make money out of it, worrying about whether they're going to get, you're going to get a big paycheck. It's just the fact that they did it and they enjoyed it and they've got a success with it. So, I, you know, I like... I, I, enjoy, I enjoy writing for, for girls, which is rather strange, I suppose, in a way, for a, a, you know, a guy like me. But I, I, I do enjoy I was, I was I had to write for Gim um, because, I, well, we, we kicked it off uh, with, with Kids in America. And um, th that, was, th that was written f uh, for a girl in 1980. I wrote that lyric as a kind of a girl, a new kind of girl that was coming out then. It was a lot different to the subservient kind of a woman or young girl that that, that was a that was around in in our country, in, particularly in America. They were so God, they, they frightened the life out of me because their their attitude was 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 quite frightening, quite strong-minded, very strong-minded, and very young, you know. And you don't the guy wouldn't tell you something. You tell him on your bike, mate. If you don't like it, up it. And so in Kids in America. You know, she's telling him, don't check on your watch. You know, you don't do this. Bugger off. You know, it's, pardon my French. Um, you know, you, you've got a, you, 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 I'm in charge. And that's what I wanted to write was a, a teenage people that were, that were going to go a very different way to the way that I'd, you know, I was fairly subservient, I suppose, to a certain extent growing up. But the, the, I, I felt there was going to be a, women were coming along that were going to be a lot different. And I was 100% right. I am surrounded, bullied, motivated by, by strong women. Um, I'll admit that. I have a wife who's been a very wonderful guiding light for me in, right through my, my life. A great, a great, great, uh, great girl. Um, but now it's been added to, which is unfortunate. One's bad enough, but when you get another one, like Kim, who's, who's, who's <laughs> she domineers me and tells me what I'm going to do. There's my daughter Roxanne who tells me what I'm going to do. And then my team that I've got around me, there are some very strong women in that team. But I, I love it because I, I'm at a time now when I, I need to be pushed. You know, I need that, I need that little bit of a, just that little kick up the back, you know, to, to, to get me moving. And uh, I, I, I recommend it. I recommend it to any guy that's un, uh, unsure about life and who's just sitting around wondering what he's going to do in life, try and meet some really strong, motivated women and it will change your life. My God, it will. Well, you know, it's been wonderful because most of it's happened during the lockdown period. And the first song that was introduced to the world from the album was Running Together. So we all had to kind of bang our heads together about how do we make a lockdown video? Yeah. And Roxanne had her children and a dog like running past the camera <laughs> and trying to try to get her her take in, in her garden in Ealing and then trying to get my take in my little garden with my kids trying to have lunch and my husband wanting to mow the lawn and um and so it went on and then mum had a few problems like filming dad so i came over and did a socially distanced film with dad and the whole thing kind of cobbled together but actually uh the, the, you know the, both the videos the running together and the 60s world have come together really spontaneously positively joyously inventively um so the lockdown period for us has had has meant that we have been able to focus really 
beautifully on this project. It's been great, hasn't it, Rox? Yeah, I think it's given us, yeah, exactly. It's, it's given us the time to sit back and appreciate what we did on the album as well, because sometimes life gets so busy. We've all had this time out to kind of just go back to what's important in a lot of ways and to remember things that we kind of might have just skipped over. And yeah, and we've we've been able to kind of really think about how we're going to plan this album and, and how to get it out there in the right way and yeah, and concentrate on it. It's been really nice. <laughs> but I remember when um, Dad first played Eddie to me, and that was back in 2017. In fact, it was probably 2016 when Dad played Eddie on my uh, Chris on the sofa at Christmas. Then he was kind of like, yeah, you know, it's a nice little song, but ah, uh, yeah, it's so Dad, isn't it? Oh, mm. and, <laughs> and I was saying, Dad, that's a beautiful song. It's, you have got to record that. And then, um, then the same thing happened with Running Together. But then he introduced him into a tour that he did in 2017, which I went to. And the songs uh, worked so brilliantly. Uh, Running Together worked brilliantly. And Eddie, which is a tribute to Eddie Cochran, a really stunning piece of work. And, um, and then from there on, he just carried on writing. And then he asked Roxanne to get involved. And you've, you've sung, I would say, what, three quarters of the album? something like that yeah yeah and it's been really lovely as well doing all the the kind of helping with the arrangements of the bbs and uh, the middle eights and various different you know lyrics and things it's been really great working with dad and um when he played me don't want to fall in love again in his room again he was like oh you know i got this the same thing i've got this idea i was like that that's really lovely it's beautiful he's like well who's gonna sing that's like me <laughs> Play me on it. <laughs> yeah, so we went in and did it and worked on it and it's great. It was you know, it's a lovely song, it's such a pleasure to sing it because you know, when you enjoy singing it's just it's a real kind of treat to be able to get your teeth into a lovely ballad like that. I mean it's just a real pleasure. Yeah. I wa I wanted Roxanne to, to shine out front, not always be the backing vocalist, you know. Uh, Kim and I have, have had our fair share of being right up there in front and Roxanne did a few times when she was working with Kylie. Kylie would push her forward and everything and and uh, she, you can see her many in, in some of the past videos she's done with, with Kylie but I, I, th I thought no let, let's push even further that you get out in the front and I'll, I'll play guitar. Uh, she's done it before we, we did we did a show at the Palladium many years ago and um, she sang there, and we, we, myself and the band, backed her up on uh, several tracks. She's, she's toured with me, you know, several times. And that, when she's brought forward, the audience love her. So, I thought, let's let's do it again this time. If it's going to be your last album, then let's let's do it for the family.
My new album uh, started off around about two years ago and I felt that it was going to be my last album. It stood a very large chance, basically because of my age. You just didn't know what was going to happen, I didn't know. And so I thought, right, if I'm going to do this, why? I can't go on singing old rock and roll songs. I've sang Blue Suede Shoes and they're brown now, you know, you're just singing so many times. So you got to, you got to, let's write songs, let's have original songs. If you can do rock and roll, write an original rock and roll song. So I ignored rock and roll and just started to write all sorts of songs, anything that came into my head. And um, I, it was really weird because normally I'd be down the pub like with the boys having a laugh and I thought, no, no pub, no this, no that. You're gonna study and you're gonna, you're gonna spend time now and you're gonna make an album. So that I did. And it changed my life completely because I don't drink anymore, which is weird. <laughs> when, you know, I used to, I would have been down, you know, like like an awful lot of men, you know, just to, not to go mad. I, I was never a big drinker, but I, I used to enjoy a drink. But now, no, because of that, I decided I would discipline myself. And I, I, I didn't lock myself away, but I spent a lot of time on lyrics, trying to get them better, trying to get the melody, trying to... Because I, I, not only do I do the... I'm very... I'm very, uh, what's the word, um, I domineer people, you know, and I, in so much, especially in the studio, I, I, most times I know what I want, always, and um, uh, most times anyway. And um, so, you know, I, in the studio, I wanted this sound, I want that sound, up with that, turn that down, write the, change the lyric there. So it was a hands-on job, very, and that went on for two years. And the songs came from all over the place, so, uh, you know, they, Oh, I, I thought, well, I'm not going to write, I'm not going to have any rock and roll in this album. It's going to be weird. And then I thought, I had an idea for um, a rock and roll song where two guys meet out on the street and a guy says to him, you know, hey, what's, what's happening in this town? You know, is, is there any action? Anything happens at all of the night time, you know? And the guy said, yeah, you know, can you come with us? I'll show you. And that's how the song started. So, um, you know, I, in the end, I wrote, uh, it's like a rockabilly track which I'm very proud of, um, just as, it was just great fun to do. It was great, great fun. Well, I, I, I didn't even think what, what should be on there or what might be on there. I just kept on writing. So I said, oh, there's this track on there called Dublin. And uh, I've always, I know I've got some Irish hereditary section to my, to my family somewhere. And my great grandmother, I think it's, uh, Moore is the name that comes up which is an Irish name, an old Irish name. And uh, so I thought, ah, Dad, you know, it'd be nice to write an Irish or a song for, for Ireland or something like that. So in the end, it came out as Dublin. And I've been to Dublin many times. Just a fantastic city, you know, and the, uh, the Irish are very hospitable people, friendly people. And um, so I tried to get that spirit of a, a man who was, who'd been away for three years but I uh, kept on getting this call in, you know, come on, get back here, you know, this is your home. And so I wrote Dublin. And um, so these songs were just appearing. Then I'd move on and write my rockabilly. Then I'd write a ballad for Roxanne. I wrote a, a really slow song, which was about, um, uh, which we, we sang today, which is a really sad song of, of a marriage or a relationship that is just not working and never will, not really. And so that's, again, different emotions, different feelings. But I've always been able to, you know, my wife said to me once, how can you write that? How can you write, um, Joyce said, how can you write that, that experience? I said, well, that's what writers do, Joy. That's what, you know, you can't have writers get in every situation they write about. Otherwise they, you know, they'd, go, they'd be strange people. So when you write, you're just writing, you've, you've, you've observed, you see what's happened, how, for example, a bad marriage can, can destroy a person um, physically and mentally. And so those kind of things, you know, go in. But um, I'm quite, you know, I'm, I'm not complicated. I'm not, comp I'm not, I'm just, I'll say it again. I'm not a complicated writer complicated person maybe but not a complicated writer 
I'm simple in many ways. I'm in many areas. I'm simple, um, but I, I like that. I like I go for melody line if I can, and not uh, and, and, a, and a strong lyric if I can. Um, I mean, I, we we put Cambodia on the track, and Cambodia was one of the best lyrics I've written. I don't think it didn't, didn't mean much in this country. I don't think somehow, but it did to the French, and they'd been there. And when it came out, I, and I it sold millions there, sold millions that single, just a single sold millions, and uh, so we put that in, and I was I'm proud, I'm glad we did. But originally it was written, it was written for Kim. Uh, well, sixties world uh, really was. I always loved the fifties. It started off that way, and I thought um, maybe a song like the fifties. Then I thought hold on you've done all that rock and roll thing let's move on a bit let's go on to the 60s what about the 60s and i thought wow what a time what a decade what a an incredible thing when i looked into it of course you know everything that was happening there there were so many things major things were happening and in our country and not just the beatles and there were songwriters there was Oh, there was it. Was, there was everything. We had some of the best fashion. The fashion was incredible for girls in those days. For, uh, Bieber's and all these fantastic shops, Carnaby Street. Then you had Lennon and McCartney writing great songs. Then the Kinks and all the boys, the Who. It was the time. And then on top of that, to top the damn lot like a cake, you got the moon landing. And I remember sitting in this house in a little tiny room at the end there, watching that moon landing all in that 10 years. And I thought, there's your song, that not about the moon landing, but there's to say what an incredible 10 years people have missed. Because I tell you, man, anyone who lived through it will tell you, it was the time. It was a time for you and it's yours and mine 
It was a place to go and a place to see Oh yeah, I'm a going back I'm back in the 60s world I'm going back <laughs> Okay well, these are, there's, a, there's a mixture. This is a, a gold-coloured, I think it's a 175, Gibson 175, but the guitar is known as the one that uh, Scotty Moore, who played for the, the very early Elvis records, That's All Right, and all those magical records, he, he, made, he played on a guitar exactly the same, gold, with this guitar. This guitar was uh, given to me by the Buddy Holly Foundation, and it's to celebrate Buddy's life. They were sent so many guitars, went round to, uh, to stars around the world. Yeah. I was lucky enough to be a recipient. So it's a lovely guitar and I'm, I'm proud of it. And I love Buddy Holly anyway. Um, Maria, Elena, Buddy's uh, widow, organized all that. So it's a lovely guitar. This one is a 6120, Chet Atkins. It's one of my favorites because I love the color. It's magnificent to play. Yeah. And it's a guitar that Eddie Cochran made famous, really. Eddie changed the pickup there. He put in a, I think it was a Gibson Firebird pickup, uh, a dark one. And, but that was the guitar, the shape and everything else that he played, same color and everything. Um, this one, uh, well, I just bought this because this is just a beautiful piece of wood, uh, just a beautiful uh, instrument to play, uh, a lovely, magnificent jazz sort of Gibson. Uh, uh, Telecaster. Looks an old telly. That is an old telly. And again, that's got had a, a new pickup. I think that's Firebird pickup, might be. But it's a, a, a different pickup, obviously, for I think it's Firebird, to get more bass. You, um, and it belonged to uh, Wings. Oh. Yeah, I think the Wings guitarist. Yeah, Jimmy, yeah. is it McCulloch? Jimmy McCulloch, is it? Jimmy McCulloch. Any lane, Jimmy no, Jimmy and Carla, yeah, right. I think it was Jimmy. I think it's Jimmy's guitar. That was. He changed the neck. He added a neck, and it was blue. We changed the colour of it. Um, that guitar is just what it is. What it is a Fender twelve string, absolute mint condition. It's not even been touched. I can't believe it's that old as well. It's probably about nineteen fifty seven, fifty eight. Um, the other guitar that was made for me, Thornbury guitar. Uh, another guitar I used. I used to use. Uh, when I was on the road, when I was a different kind of man then, because I used to paint my name all large, as I felt that I had to, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe just feel the acoustic section. Yeah, well, the acoustic, the they... The incredible Gibsons, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, they had that another... There's a J200 there, um, which that, that is not an old one, but it is a magnificent piece of wood and, and playing it just this is the one that you said might be a classic in 40 years that one will be i mean without a question that will be a classic in 40 years it just has the tone already you know you just know when you're playing them the, um this one is is lovely it's a guild 12 string and very very loud it's like a you play it it's like a full orchestra wonderful guitar a taylor a lovely taylor guitar that is just a uh, a beautiful guitar, beautifully made. Another J200, uh, which I had, I've had this. This is the one I use on stage, and that one also on stage. Uh, and this last one is a 42nd Street, uh, which was made for me in the last two years. And it's a beautiful guitar. I love it to bits. So I, um, and that's not all, Ma. I've still got other ones as well. So, uh, yeah, I have a, I have a collection. <laughs> well, it, it, it's good to have a record Records of was it eight? How many? How many years has it gone? Eight decades. Eight yeah. decades. Oh my goodness me! And to beat Cliff Richard is always a pleasure. I mean, um, he and I have been friends and rivals for years, but um, he's had a wonderful career and a good buddy. He's a good man. But it's lovely to beat him. I've always want to beat him. But I'm very ambitious as well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my guest this week happens to be a very, very good friend of mine. Uh, we'd like to do an album together which just happens to be his latest recording arrangement. It's Rubber Ball and Marty Wilde.
I can, yeah, I can, I can well, tell you. Yeah. One of my favorite rock and roll stories was <laughs> was we were do, we were on a well, well. This is just one of a thousand thousand stories. There was a we had one of the guys who should, a rock and roller who should remain nameless, and he's he had this idea that if he stood on the amp and jumped off the amp. Uh, just trying to think, yeah, that's right. He had this idea, if he jumped off on top of the amp like that, and then jumped down, ran out, down the side of the steps, which he could do at this particular theatre, and he's going to run right through the audience. And uh, so I said to him, what are you going to do that for? He said, you watch the shock, it to be fantastic. He said, suddenly I'm on stage, I'll go around, the, and he didn't go around to the steps, he went around the side, which you can do. He said, and I'll come bursting through the audience. Okay, fine, you know, we, this, that's what you want to do, you do. And, uh, so anyway, the, the night came, and, and, and so he's, he's singing away there, and he was going down quite well. So he, off he goes, he goes running out, he comes out the side and people go, oh, and as true as he said, he runs through the audience and they're all going, oh, look, he's suddenly here. He runs right the way through, he goes out the front door and he comes right the way around to get in the stage door, but the stage door was locked. So that ended the performance. <laughs> we just sat there watching for another five, eight minutes while the band were going, ding, 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 